Welcome back to our series on statistical methods. In this uh, first part, we're going to discuss ANOVA and design of experiments. My name is Mark Ledbetter, and this is Lecture 2, Part 1, and we are starting off with uh, Chapter 2 in our textbook, which is Design and Analysis of Experiments by Douglas Montgomery in 8th edition is the one we're using. And so we're going to start off Chapter 2, and Chapter 2 talks about comparing two samples, and so we're going to use methods that you may have seen before uh, that really are the simplest of uh, e designed experiments, but they're only good in certain cases, very simple cases. So let's review what we talked about in Chapter 1. We said there, there were two types of studies, observational and design of experiments. And it turns out that the um, analysis methods we'll learn in the ANOVA section w can be applied to both of these. The interpretations, what will be different? If you design of ex an experiment, you can um, talk about um, cause and effect, if you will. If you uh, are talking about an observational uh, study, then all you can talk about are inferences about what the relationships are. Okay. Now, processes, <clears throat> they have inputs, and some of those inputs are controllable factors, which we call Z, and some of them are uncontrollable factors, I'm sorry, X, and some of them are uncontrollable factors, which we use Z to represent. And then, of course, all of those uh, affect the output variable that we want to measure. The objectives of a experiment, <clears throat> we want to figure out which variables have the most influence on the outcome. We will also would like to determine, many cases, determine the optimal settings to first achieve the proper location or target value of our response variable. Secondly, we want to minimize the variation, again, of our output or response variable. And then thirdly, we want to find uh, these settings that will minimize the effect um, of uncontrollable variables on our output. So <clears throat> we want to make the, the process robust as possible. Okay. Three basic principles of experimentation we, we discussed. Randomization is uh, running the experiments in a random order and also assigning... Uh, assigning the factor levels uh, randomly to the experimental units. Then replication is how many times or how many subjects or <clears throat> um, experimental units are exposed to the exact same uh, factor levels of the experiment. It's not uh, repeating the experiment over on the same experimental unit. That's called repeated measures, and that's not, not what we're talking about. Although we can do design of experiments on that special case. <clears throat> and then blocking is used to make um, uh, the testing conditions as homogeneous as possible within each block. So the example we gave was the raw material uh, in the hardness testing uh, example where it came from two different lots of material and so we took and we um, blocked it by the lot of material so within each block the material is homogeneous as it can be okay <clears throat> then experimentation strategies we talked about the best guest approach which can work but you have to be a, a subject matter expert and there are many drawbacks to that as well. And then we talked about one factor at a time testing, which is really uh, insufficient. It ignores the um, possible interaction between elements, so you can really come up with some uh, bad results when interaction is significant. And then lastly, we said that there's factorial design, and we can consider that like an umbrella of general uh, <clears throat> description of experimental designs. And as you will see. Okay, and finally we talked about the guidelines for designing experiments and the first step is to state the problem in detail and we said that this is the step that in actual practice gets either skipped or uh, half done uh, most often and if you're not careful and you not do this uh, step properly, then you could perform the experiment and end up with results that are unusable because you 
uh, didn't do this first uh, planning step. Then, of course, we want to select and determine or determine what is our response variable or variables. What is it we're trying to uh, find information out? What is it we're measuring? What's important to this process? And then uh, thirdly, we choose the factors and the levels and ranges of controllable variables. Um, so factor levels within, within those variables. And we'll choose based on our, um, our process and what it is we're trying to study and the variables and the setup of this, we'll choose an experimental design. And there are many types of experimental designs and, it's, it, and each one is uh, set up for a different type of uh, relationship between the um, input variables and the output variables. Then we'll perform the experiment, statistically analyze the data, and then we'll draw conclusions and or make recommendations. And this recommendation or conclusion may be a second round of testing to find out more in some cases. All right. So chapter two uh, is simple comparative experiments. And we are going to, again, compare two samples uh, and see if we can measure the differences between them. So you may have seen some of these uh, methods or techniques previously. So how do we, so the first step is we're going to, uh, or the first thing we're going to cover is describing sample data. And uh, we're going to talk about random samples, sample mean variance, standard deviation, population versus samples, uh, population mean variance, standard deviation, and estimating parameters. Okay, so so to describe sample data, we need to know what a random sample is. So remember that Y is our output, so we're going to be talking in terms of Y in this course. So a random sample would be the random variables Y1 to Yn, um, which are I, I, D, with some PMF or PDF, F of Y. Okay, so I, I, D, sorry about that, I, I, D, means independent and identically distributed. Okay. Now, when we have taken a sample, we want to calculate the sample mean in most cases, and so y bar is 1 over n times the sum of y i, i equals 1 to n. The sample variance, you should know this formula as well. This is the definition of the uh, formula. So 1 over n minus 1 sum from i equals 1 to n of um, y i minus y bar quantity squared. And then the sample standard deviation s is simply the square root of s squared. And it's going to be a positive. We're always taking the positive for the standard deviation. Now, a population uh, consists of all possible values of a random variable, or it consists of all members of a universal set or something called the sample space okay, that we talked about uh, in probability theory. And then a sample is just a subset of the population. Now, random samples should represent the entire population if the sampling plan is, uh, is appropriate for the population, okay? So, um, so samples are subsets, and we have all of these are statistics here. These are statistics, and they are estimators of the corresponding population parameters. And population parameters are values that w are usually unknown, but they are, um, they are characteristics of the population. So um, before we get there, let's, well, populations are described by probability distributions. So we have two major types of probability distributions. I don't cover all three here, but do know that there's mixed. So you can have a mixture of discrete and continuous. So on part of the 
uh, range of the uh, value, in this case y, it might be discrete, and on another range of the values of y, it might be continuous. Okay, so for discrete distributions, we're going to use p instead of f to for the PMF and probability. So the probability of y sub j is between 0 and 1 for all um, yj. And then the probability that y is equal to yj is simply p of yj for all y sub j. Now, the sum over all y sub j of y sub j is equal to 1. Okay, So you add them all up. Um, I'm sorry, this is p of yj. So this should be the sum of p sub of y sub j. Uh, and this is... Uh, for this, we could we could say uh, we could assume that it's from y equals one to capital N, but um, they don't have to be consecutive, so uh, we'll just say all y sub j, and then the expected value is mu, which is e of y, and that again is the sum across all y, um, y times p of y. Okay. Now, for the continuous distribution, or a continuous distribution, first we say that f of y, the PDF, is greater than or equal to zero. So it's non-negative. And then we have to use a range of values in order to get probability. So the probability that y is between some values a and b is equal to the integral of f of y dy from a to b. And then the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of the PDF, f of y, is equal to 1. Now, <clears throat> again, we're using negative infinity to positive infinity, but that doesn't mean that y, in every case, has a support that is uh, from negative infinity to positive infinity. For a beta distribution, the support is between 0 and 1. For a gamma distribution, between 0 and, and positive infinity. Okay, and similarly mu is equal to the expected value of y, but now instead of a summation, we are, sum, we are integrating y, f of y, dy uh, over all possible values. Now, uh, for discrete distribution, um, the variance, sigma squared, can be written as the sum of y minus mu quantity squared times p sub y. For a continuous distribution, we replace the summation with the integral. So we have y minus mu squared f of y dy. Okay. Now, now for both, the variance of y that we're going to use in this textbook just v. Before, I've used variance of y, but the book shortens it to just v of y. That's sigma squared. And we can write it as expectation of y minus mu squared, which simplifies to e of y squared minus mu squared. So if we let y1 and y2 be random variables, then the covariance of y1, y2 is given by e of y1 minus mu1 times y2 minus mu2, and this can be... Uh, simplified to the expected value of y1 times y2 minus mu1 times mu2. So this is all a review of probability theory. Now, the expected value of a constant is simply a constant. The expected value of a random variable is the mean of that random variable. And then the expected value of a constant times a random variable, the constant comes out to the front, and we get c, e, of y, which is c mu. And then the variance of a constant is zero because um, there is no variation in a constant. It's, it's constant. And then the variance of um, a random variable is simply the variance of sigma y uh, squared, which is, um, yeah, we'll leave it at that for this. And then the variance of a constant times y, remember that the variance of y is equal to the covariance of y 
with itself. And so if it's CY, we have to put a C here and a C here, and we've got two constants that come out. So this is going to be C squared um, variance of Y, which is C squared sigma squared. Okay. Now, um, remember that Y1 and Y2 um, uh, are random variables. So the expected value of y1 and y plus y2 is simply the expected value of y1 plus the expected value of y2, which is mu1 plus mu2. Um, if they're the means of the of y1 and the mean of y2. Now the variance of y1 plus y2 is going to be the variance of y1 plus 2 covariance of y1, y2, plus the variance of y2. We did not say that they were independent, so we cannot, um, we cannot uh, get rid of the covariance. Now, it turns out that the negative gets squared. And so when we square the negative, we end up with a positive. So we end up with exactly the same thing. Y, variance of Y1, and then we get, um, oh, not exactly, minus 2 covariance of Y1, Y2, plus the variance of Y2. Okay? So the negative with the negative for the variance is a positive. But for y1, my, uh, covariance of y1, y2, negative y2, that's going to be negative. All right. Now, if y1 and y2 are independent, then it doesn't matter whether it's plus or minus because of the square. The variance, the covariance is equal to zero. So we end up simply with the variance of y1 plus the variance of y2. Oh, and I can write these as uh, sigma 1 squared plus sigma 1, 2 plus sigma, or that's 2 sigma 1, 2 equals sigma 1 squared plus, or yeah, plus 2 sigma 1, 2 uh, plus sigma 2 squared. And this is equal to sigma 1 squared minus 2 sigma 1, 2 plus sigma 2 squared. And so this is equal to sigma 1 squared plus sigma 2 squared. Now, we said that these are independent. And so if they're independent, only if they're independent, is this equal to E of uh, Y1 times E of Y2, which is equal to mu1 mu2. Now, this didn't come out very clear, but... This is not equal to. Okay, so when we divide expectations, uh, it is not equal to E of Y1 over E of Y2. This is wrong. It's not that. Regardless of whether X and Y, or yeah, Y1 and Y2, sorry, not X and Y, Y1 and Y2, are independent or not. Okay, so it's never equal to the, the ratio of those expectations, mu1 over mu2. It's never that. Okay, so that's a pitfall that students fall into because they think that multiplication and division are the same. They're not. Okay, so let's talk about if, if we take a sample, we're going to want to summarize the data so that we can get a feeling for uh, what the data um, looks like and feels like, if you will. Uh, you know, find out some, by feel like, I mean, um, find out some information about it. So, usually we will report n, which is the sample size, the mean, the standard deviation, the minimum value, the first quartile, remember that's the 25th percentile, so 25% of the data is below Q1. The median, half is below the median, that's also Q2. And then the third quartile, P75, or the 75th percentile, the maximum value of the data, and if there are any missing values. Um, that comes into play when we have uh, more than one sample. This brings us to our first example.
This is called a Portland cement example. We have an engineer that added this polymer latex emulsion uh, during the mixing process. And the reason that this person did that was to try to lower the cure time of the mortar so it sets up faster. But there's a concern that um, by adding this emulsion, it could affect the tension bond strength. In fact, it could make it worse by making it lower. And so 10 samples of the original formulation and 10 samples of that modified formulation were um, prepared and tested and we see the results to the right. There were, we're going to say that there are two treatments and these are the formulations with and without the emulsion. Or we could say there's two levels of the factor called formulations. All right, so here are the data. And if we look at the data, uh, it's always more difficult to look at data than to look at summaries of the data. But let's take a look at the data. And if we look at um, the first column, more uh, modified mortar, then we notice that there's uh, less uh, values in the 17s than there are in the unmodified, okay? So that indicates that maybe the unmodified mortar has a higher average um, tension bond strength so, uh, than the modified. So maybe the modified did, in fact, lower this tension bond strength. So we're going to be using R and I want to uh, give you the code so that you can perform these analysis yourself. So what we did in this one, uh, um, we're wanting to get the descriptive statistics. So these summarize the data so that we can have a, a better feel for uh, the differences between these two groups or formulations. So the data was given to us in this format here but we really need to reformat um, the data so that we can more easily analyze it. And this happens a lot in analyses, that the data comes in one format and we need it in another. So we are using the function melt from the reshape2 package. Okay, that's melt. And what we're doing is we're taking uh, data set Y1 and Y1, and it looks a lot like this table. Uh, I've put ID over here, and then I used modified and unmodified as the column names for that um, Y1 data frame. And so in order to do this, I do not want the ID number uh, included. So I said that, I'll zoom in, so Y1 is my data frame. The brackets tell me, allow me to specify rows and columns. So rows are before the comma, and so I'm saying give me all the rows from columns 2 to 3. Okay. Now, I'm also saying remove any NAs. NAs are missing values in the data. That's how R handles them. And then the value name, in other words, the uh, what happens to the data that's in rows two and three, what should we call that? I'm saying I'm going to call it strength for tension bond strength. Well, by default, uh, um, the uh, titles of two and three become uh, a value called variable. They become a, um, a column called variable. But I don't like the word variable as my column name, so I'm changing the column names of this to treatment, and then I'm keeping strength. Okay. Now, I could just change the first one. I think you can do uh, this uh, at the end of this and just set this, this um, variable to treatment here. But uh, really, for me, it seems to be... Uh, I might have to debug that or something. So I just went ahead and renamed them both. Okay. So then we're going to use the um, favstat um, uh, function, and it's from the mosaic package. So favstats, 
This function is from the mosaic package. Okay. And so what we do is we want the strength. This is like y equals x, but um, if you will. So our y values are the strength. That's our output. And we're wanting to separate it or group it by treatment, which would be the modified versus the unmodified. And then we have to specify which data set it is. Otherwise, we can put um, y0 dollar sign strength and then the tilde and then y0 dollar sign treatment. But you can see that this could become very... Uh, tedious if you have more than one variable that you want to uh, group by or um, if you have a long table name which sometimes happens okay so once we melt the data here this these first two uh, rows once we melt the data what does it look like so it looked it looks like this over on the right so I'm going to zoom in and so we've got the treatment here and so for the first 10 values, they go with the modified treatment. And the last 10 values are with the unmodified treatment. Okay? So then we call this um, fav stats, and we say, I want the strength, but I want it grouped by treatment. So modified and unmodified. Now, I've also... Um, included some code in the file that I will give you um, that uh, makes this a table. And um, by doing that, it makes it easy for you to copy and paste and put in other things if you want to. So here is the modified grouping. And you can see that favstats uh, gives you the min, the first quartile, which is... Uh, the 25th percentile, so 25% of the data are in each group are below these values. The median, which is also Q2, the second quartile, or 50% is below those values. And then Q3, the 75th percentile. And of course, we've got the maximum value. So we've got the minimum value and the maximum value, always handy to have. The mean of each and the standard deviation of each and how many items are in each group, so 10, and are there any missing, and there's zero missing from each. So this gives us a better picture. In fact, if we look at the mean, we can see that um, there's about a 0.28 difference between the two means, between or between the group, the mean of the groups. So about 0.28 kilogram for centimeter squared. All right. So is that significant or not? Um, I don't know much about cement, so I don't know if that's significant or not. That's where the subject matter expert would have to help us out. Now, that's one way to do descriptive statistics, and it gives us everything we normally need. But if you need a few more uh, values, so if you're needing skewness and kurtosis, um, then you might want to use the describe by um, function, and it's from the um, psych package, P-S-Y-C-H package in R, okay? And you'll see that we've, we've got a lot more items down here. We've got different ones, though. So it tells you the number of variables in each, which is, uh, I don't know when it would ever be more than one, but I guess it could be. And then in is 10 in each. Here's the mean, the same number, standard deviation. Now they give us the median, but they and they give us the min and the max, but they don't give us the first and third quor, um, quartiles. They give us a trimmed mean. Uh, you'll have to look in the documentation to see how they trim it. Uh, so they throw out some values, the highest and lowest values. I don't know how many of each. And then the mean uh, absolute distance. So MAD is equal to the 1 over n sum of the absolute value of yi minus y bar. And from i equals 1 to n. <clears throat> Unlike s, which is the square root of 1 over n minus 1 sum of yi minus y bar quantity squared. 
Now, um, so you can see that these values are a little different. And um, when we're looking at the variation, S is a um, um, slightly biased estimator. S squared is not. Um, for S squared is a uh, unbiased estimator for the variance, but S is a slightly biased estimator for the standard deviation. And, uh, but the MAD is another measure of um, variation in the data. And so then we have the range, which is the, the max minus the min. They give us the skewness and kurtosis, and then also the standard error of each group. So these values can be handy. We use the standard error to calculate confidence intervals, so that's nice to have. Okay, so those, that's how we can get descriptive statistics, but let's move on to something uh, even better. So we'd like to um, picture the data, so summarize the data using a graph or picture. So we're going to use a histogram as the first graphical um, exploratory analysis. We're going to, to create a histogram for um, each of the groups, modified and unmodified. So the first thing that we need to do is change the parameters so that we can have uh, two graphs on the same line. Uh, so this is the number of graphs per row, which we're keeping at one, and we're changing the number of graphs per, I'm sorry, this is the number of uh, graphs per column, and this is the number of graphs per row. So there's going to be one row and uh, two columns is what it is. Okay. And so um, one row, two graphs across. This simply sets all the text size to a font size of 10 within the graph. If you want to do that, you don't have to. You can comment that out. So that way your... Um, your um, title is a little bit bigger than the rest of the, than your axes labels. Okay, so we're going to use the function histogram, which is in the basic graphics package, so you don't have to install any packages for that. And I wanted the, but I can only do this um, really one at a time with this function, so I've got uh, y1 modified, and then frequency is true, that means I want the frequency on the y-axis, and then the main is the title of the uh, histogram, so tension bond strength, and this is for the modified group. X limit is uh, basically the values of the tension bond strength. So I graphed these and uh, saw, saw what they look like and said, I'm going to uh, put the values between 16 and 17.6, and um, <clears throat> then... I also looked at the graphs and saw how many were in each category, and the max was 3, so I made this go a little higher, 3.5. And then the number of classes or um, bars in there, I want it to try to give me 5. Now, it may give me 4, it may give me 6, but it'll be close to 5. And then the label for the x-axis is the tension bond strength, and we always put the units here, and um, <clears throat> um, I could... I should make this um, TE capital X and then put everything in there and uh, that would make this actually become a square, which I, I should have done, but I didn't. Okay. And then we have the second histogram, which is almost identical, except that it's the unmodified group. And so um, everything else is the same. And then I have to set my parameters back to only allow one graph uh, per row, one graph per column. Uh, there. So one row, one column for each graph. So change it back or else it will do the same thing every time afterwards. So here are our uh, histograms. So for the modified, so what if you don't set the x limits here to the same for both of them, it's harder to compare because the values down here will start at different values, like it started at 16.5 on this graph and it started at 16.2 or something like that on this graph. So by, by setting these numbers the same, it's like comparing apples to apples, oranges to oranges type of thing. Um, it's easier to see that these values are shifted a little higher, seemingly, than these for the modified. And you'll notice that I had uh, six bars here. Of course, one of them has nothing in there, and then I only have four bars here. So... 
even though I set it to five. The only way to guarantee that you're going to get the exact number of classes that you want is to plug in something called the breaks. Um, and those are the boundaries in between the bars. And if you put those in correctly, um, and there's some uh, trickiness to that, just a little bit, where um, don't remember if you put in the first one and not the last one, or if you put in the first and the last, or just the last one, I, I don't remember, but um, you have to be careful with that, or else you'll end up with a mess. Okay, so that's the uh, first graphical method. Another graphical method that the books goes over is something called a dot plot. And so the function for dot plot is given here, and let's see, so dot plot is in which package? Uh, not sure. It's um, not sure which package. It may be the uh, base graphics package, but um, in any case, we do the same thing. Strength by treatment, we're using Y0, the melted data, and I set my Y limits to the same values as I did in the histograms just to be consistent, and this graph over here with the blue dots is what we get with R. Now, I didn't put a title up there. Um, I certainly could have put main equals within the function somewhere, you know, and given ourselves a title. And that would have been good of me to do, but I, I, I missed that. Okay, so we've got modified, unmodified. You can see that, um, that there's some shift in data. Now, the book provided this dot plot here using different software, um, maybe Maple or um, MATLAB or SAS or something. And so the modified and unmodified are a lot closer to each other, and which makes it easier to compare, I think. And you can see that the first four values in the modified are lower than all of the values in the unmodified. And then you can see that the last three values in the modified, unmodified are higher in tension bond strength than any of the values in the modified group. And they've also told, showed us where the means of each of the groups are, which is helpful as well to see um, that makes it look like there's quite the separation there when it's 0.28 kilogram force per centimeter squared. Okay. Now, the third and final um, graphical analysis we're going to look at in this uh, chapter is called the box plot. And many of you have uh, seen a box plot before. And, but let me quickly go over the box plot. First, the code. Um, again, we have strength by treatment and the data of Y0, the melted data. And that allows us to put both box plots on the same graph without having to change those parameters, you know, the par MF call uh, functions that I had before. And then I have the title and then I have the X label, and then in order to get my Y label in the right position, I had to put Y lab is equal to double quotes, just empty. And then I came back with the title function and said the Y lab is equal to, and the important part is line. The default for line is three, so it put it so close to the edge that the square here was cut off. So I wanted to move it this way. And so line, this, this uh, call for line, tells me how many lines away from the y-axis in that direction. The first line is about right here. So when I said line was equal to 1, it was uh, jumbled up with the um, y-axis values. And so I moved it to 2, and it was crunched down real close to it. So I moved it to 2.5. I knew that 3 is the default, and that was too far. Now here, I was um, good enough to use the, uh, the text function. And uh, then you just put your string in there. And because you're using text, a text is a um, form of LaTeX. And LaTeX is a typesetting language that we use to publish documents such as dissertations or thesis for um, grad school. And so it, it actually um, can evaluate this, this and made it a square. So um, it makes it look professional. All right. So now that this was the one that uh, 
these are the box plots, plots that uh, I created with R. Now, what this is the minimum value. The, the lower part of the box, or if you flip these horizontal, the left side of the box, this is Q1. The line in the middle is Q2, the median. Q3 is this edge of the box, and then the max is up here. So, <clears throat> and we can look at the box plot, and if we rotate this, um, we would have something like that, and we could see that this side is bigger, and we'd say that this was skewed to the right. For the modified. But when we look at the unmodified, this is slightly, very slightly bigger. This side might be slightly bigger, but it's approximately um, symmetric for the uh, unmodified. So the modified, modifying this with the emulsion um, has uh, skewed the data and it looks like it's uh, lowered the uh, tension bond strength according to this study. Okay, that's it for this video. If you have questions, please come to virtual office hours. If you can't make it to virtual office hours and you need help before then, by all means, email me and I will be happy to help you and get back to you as soon as I can. So please take care of yourself, stay safe, so that we hope to see you next time.